This video is going to focus on systolic heart failure, which is weakness of the main heart muscle. In systolic heart failure, the heart itself can't pump enough blood to the body. So patients may get short of breath, they may get swelling in their legs, the kidneys may not function normally, they can build up fluid in their body. We're going to talk about what symptoms patients should look out for, what tests they should do, and the best ways to treat it. So if you're a patient and you notice that your legs are starting to swell and you don't have an answer as to why, or you're short of breath, oftentimes that could be worse either lying down at night or it could be worse when you're exercising, that may be a sign of congestive heart failure and it's something that you should notify your physician. If you are a physician and somebody's seeing you because you're short of breath and you notice swelling in the legs, it may not be a heart related issue but the majority of those patients should at least get an echo or an ultrasound to see if the heart function is normal or abnormal. If the heart function is abnormal, then the question is why is it abnormal and that should be treated. Too often we've seen patients who present to a physician because of shortness of breath, they may find fluid in their lungs or swollen legs, the doctor puts them on a water pill, they urinate and they feel better, but nobody ever looks into why that happened in the first place. So building a fluid or being short of breath raises the question that has to be found out, why did this occur? And one of the common causes is systolic congestive heart failure. So if someone gets an ultrasound and you realize the heart muscle is weaker than it should be, the question at that point is why is the heart muscle weaker than it should be? In a developed world, two out of three people with weakness of the heart muscle had that because of blockages in the arteries around the heart. So if the heart muscle is weaker than it should be, the arteries need to be looked at somehow. If there's only minimal weakness of the heart muscle, oftentimes a stress test can be done. And if the stress test doesn't show blockages in the arteries, then that's a patient we would treat with medications or look at other possible causes. And other possible causes can include everything from drinking too much alcohol too much alcohol may only be two or three drinks per day. It could be heavy metal poisoning. Several decades ago in Canada, they put a small amount of a heavy metal in one of the beers that were sold and people were developing heart failure, not because they were drinking too much beer, although that likely contributed, but because of the heavy metal. And the heavy metal was put in the beers so that it would stick to oil on a glass and more foam would show up in the glass instead of losing the foam from oils in the glass. So heavy metal toxicity is real and it does happen at times, sometimes in large populations, sometimes if people just are exposed to too many heavy metals. So there's other causes of systolic heart failure. If it is related to blockages in the arteries though, that's something we need to find out. If the heart muscle is very weak, you know, a normal ejection fraction, and if you look at an echo report and you're a patient and it says ejection fraction 65% and you say why is it not 100%? A normal heart pumps out about 65-70% of the blood at rest when you're not doing anything. The reason it doesn't pump out 100% is if you pump out 65% at rest, let's say, and I ask you, let's run up and down the hallway and then look at your heart afterwards, well at that point it may pump out 75% or 80% of the blood. When you do more activity, your muscles need more blood flow. The two ways to generate more blood flow is to increase the heart rate so the heart beats faster, but the heart also beats stronger, so each time it beats, it pumps out more blood. That's often why very well-trained athletes like cyclists or marathon runners, their heart rates are relatively low to start, and sometimes their ejection fraction is actually lower than what a normal cutoff is, which is 50%, because they have much more reserve, and part of that is conditioning. Oftentimes it gets tough in a very conditioned athlete who's starting to lose some of their stamina to figure out do they have a separate problem or is the heart muscle weak just because of their vigorous endurance activity. This isn't the everyday guy who runs for an hour or so. These are true endurance athletes. If the heart muscle is very weak, so under 35% we get concerned because there, there's a higher risk of sudden death, especially if there's blockages in the arteries around the heart. If somebody's ejection fraction is under 25 or 30 percent, oftentimes we won't even bother doing a stress test and we'll go straight to an angiogram. Stress tests aren't 100 percent and they can miss small things. If somebody's ejection fraction is very weak, even missing a small thing, which might be helpful, can't be risked. So those people, your doctor may say, you're going straight to an angiogram, 
And also while we do an angiogram to look at the arteries around the heart, we can put a separate IV in to measure the pressures inside the different chambers of the heart, which helps us guide our medications. That can be done at the same time. They're very reasonable approaches. And if you're a patient and the doctor is suggesting one versus the other, ask the question. Patients oftentimes don't want to take the doctor's time. Take the doctor's time. That's what you're there for. You're the patient, the doctor's there. He should explain why he's ordering the specific tests for you. So based on that, if we find blockages in the arteries, if those blockages are feeding heart muscle that's alive, improving those blockages make patients better. There was an old trial from the 90s called STITCH, which looked at suboptimal ways of determining if heart muscle was alive or not, and then using that to guide therapy to either do bypass or put in stents. And that didn't show much of a benefit. With our current ways of looking to see if heart, muscles, heart muscle is alive, specifically things like PET studies, which is a nuclear study, usually we use a radioactive glucose, or MRIs, we're very accurate at determining whether heart muscle can be salvaged or not salvaged. If it can be salvaged, fixing the arteries will make that patient better almost 100% of the time. If the heart muscle is already dead, then there's no point in doing stents or bypass. We can do that, but we're subjecting patients to a risk of a procedure, and then you're restoring blood flow to dead heart muscle, which isn't going to get any better. There's no sense in doing it at that point. So it's very critical to determine if it is blockages in the arteries, are those blockages feeding heart muscle that's alive or heart muscle that's not alive? Because that determines whether we fix it or we don't fix it. Not all centers have the capability of doing PET scans to look for viability or doing MRIs. So if you are in a rural or remote area and you don't have those capabilities, especially if your heart muscle is very weak, it would be prudent to go to a larger institution that offers those studies because that's the best way to manage what's going to happen to you going forward. Regardless of what we find with blockages in the arteries, the second half of this is medications. We have very good medications that improve the strength of the heart muscle. And this could be everything when I didn't mention before, sometimes women after pregnancies can develop what we call a peripartum cardiomyopathy. Sometimes patients, believe it or not, can get stressed to the point that their heart itself gets weaker. And it's what we call a stress-induced or a Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Those are oftentimes very reversible, but even in those circumstances, medications will increase the chances of the heart muscle getting better. And the more medications we give and the higher the doses of medications, usually the quicker the improvement of the heart muscle and the better the heart muscle gets. If it's an alcoholic heart myopathy and a patient doesn't want to stop drinking, regardless of what medications we use, their heart muscle is unlikely to get better over a period of time. So if it is due to alcohol, patients need to quit drinking. If it's an obesity-induced cardiomyopathy, what happens is, your heart's a pump, it's like a car engine. Now, we had a little smart car, which is a two-seater, and it has a little, not even a one-liter engine that drives the car. Well, I could take that engine out and put it in Escalade, and it'll drive the Escalade, but it's gonna burn out a whole lot faster than a four, five, or six-liter engine that drives the Escalade. The same thing happens with obesity. So human beings were built to be a certain size, and the heart's built to be a certain size. If people double or triple their weight, that car engine, just like the pancreas when I talked about diabetes in the lifestyle lecture, it can only work on overdrive for a certain period of time. And then once it can't keep up anymore, then it starts burning out. So if somebody's got an obesity-induced cardiomyopathy, the only true answer to really make the heart muscle better and keep it better is to get the weight down and usually significantly down. It's not losing five pounds or 10 pounds. This is losing 50 to 100 or 200 pounds. Oftentimes, medications to help weight loss or gastric bypass would be life-saving either procedures or medications for those patients to help them get the weight down. Medications may help the heart for a short period of time, but that's only applying a Band-Aid. It's not getting to the underlying problem that caused the heart muscle to get weak. Regarding the medications, the most common classes of drugs that we use are beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. Beta blockers decrease the barrage of hormones hitting the heart. To explain that in a little detail, if you watch a horse race, the rider that's on the horse is hitting the horse with a stick on the side. The reason to do that is the horse gets angry and the horse goes faster. 
Well, if the heart muscle is weak, what happens is the body produces more hormones. And the hormones I'm talking about are things like epinephrine and norepinephrine and dopamine. But those hormones are stimulated by the body to make the heart beat stronger. So it's a normal physiologic reaction if the body senses that the, that the heart's weaker than it should be to produce more hormones. And those hormones eventually will make the heart muscle stronger. Well, over time, the process that causes the heart muscle to get weaker, unless you fix that process, continues. And then those hormones need to produce, get produced even more and even more. Well, at some point, those hormones can't keep up anymore, and then patients start getting symptoms. What beta blockers do, beta blockers decrease the barrage of those hormones hitting the heart. So usually initially when we put patients on beta blockers, for a couple days they may feel a little more sluggish or a little bit weaker, but what happens is you stop that barrage of hormones, you allow the heart muscle to recover a little bit, and then as that heart muscle recovers, then you can gradually increase the dose of these medications. So we usually start patients on lower doses and gradually, when I talk about gradually, every two to three weeks, titrate up or go up in the dose of medications. ACE inhibitors or a subclass called angiotensin II blockers are a subsequent... That's a cuckoo clock. ACE inhibitors or a subsequent class of medications called angiotensin II blockers, if a patient can't tolerate an ACE inhibitor, decreases the resistance in the arteries. There's an electrical formula, V equals I, or voltage is equals to, equal to current times resistance. So the voltage is the strength of the heart. Current is a blood flow going through the arteries, and the resistance is a resistance with the vessels. If you can decrease the resistance, either your voltage is going to improve or your current's going to improve. So ACE inhibitors and angiotensin II blockers decrease the resistance. By decreasing resistance, you also lower blood pressure. Beta blockers, by decreasing the barrage of hormones, lower blood pressure as well. So sometimes a limiting factor is if patients come in with a very low blood pressure and they have too much fluid built up, it's often difficult to give them enough water pills to get rid of the fluid while at the same time giving them these medications. So oftentimes what we'll do is get rid of fluid first and then start the medications. If somebody specifically has a lot of fluid that's built up in their lungs or their oxygen levels are so low because they can't get enough air into the lungs, meaning oxygen and carbon dioxide out from the lungs. If patients have higher blood pressure, it actually makes it easier for us at that point to use multiple, med multiple medications at the same time, both to get rid of fluid and to improve the strength of the heart muscle over time. There's a newer agent called Entresto, which has been on the market for several years, and Entresto works better than older ACE inhibitors in one large study. Entresto is also a very potent blood pressure drug, so if patients are starting with low blood pressure, it's not a great drug to give patients at the beginning. If someone has higher blood pressure, it oftentimes is a very good drug to use at the beginning. There's another old-fashioned drug called digoxin, which in a separate video I'll discuss in more detail, but the Joxa can help improve symptoms related to heart failure. Doesn't make people live longer like beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, or Entresto do, but it improves symptoms of congestive heart failure. And especially if people still have a lot of symptoms despite the medications we're giving them, we'll add the Joxin that doesn't lower blood pressure either, so it's a drug that we can use along the whole process. But we also need to be careful with it because if those levels get too high in the bloodstream, that can cause side effects. For most patients, we will check labs. We want that level to be less than 1.2. If the level's higher than 1.2, there's a higher risk of side effects and no real benefit. And this is more for a physician to realize I need to remember to monitor the digoxin level. If that digoxin level is 2.2, they're getting too much of the drug and I will cut back in the drug. I hope you enjoyed this video on systolic heart failure. If this is not what you have and you have a heart muscle that's too thick and too stiff, there's going to be a separate video talking about diastolic heart failure. Hope, hopefully you enjoy that video. Have a good afternoon.